uh, safe food. And um, our goal as restaurateurs and hospitality managers is to make sure that when we cook and serve our food to our guests that we don't get anyone sick. And as we said on Tuesday's lecture, the most important thing is that knowing who your resources are, where you're purchasing your food from, are they purchased from recognized sourced food vendors? Uh, so that's the first part of it. Then the next part is how the food is being delivered and stored. So we have to understand the importance of the food safety. All of you uh, probably have been seeing on the news right now that there is an outbreak of salmonella with a product line of Italian meats, uh, cold cuts, hams, sausages, and uh, bacons that are uh, an Italian variation and variety that's distributed throughout the United States. And it's a massive amount of meat that has salmonella. And so they're trying to resource where the salmonella came from. Uh, and that's why you wanna know who your vendor is. If you are buying meat that is not USDA inspected and it's not from a recognized sourced vendor, you're not gonna be able to track or trace where you had this outbreak of foodborne or salmonella. Okay, foodborne illness is a disease that's transmitted by uh, people. Just like you're seeing right now with the coronavirus, uh, it's transmitted through uh, sneezing, coughing, breathing, et cetera. Well, salmonella and the E. coli, which are the two most uh, prominent outbreaks of bacteria, pathogenic bacteria in our industry are caused by the intestines of humans. So after people use the restrooms, they're not washing their hands thoroughly. It also comes from the intestines of animals. So chicken, hogs, and beef, if they're not uh, grazed properly, washed properly, and kept in a wholesome sanitary area, they'll have, uh, they could have the potential of E. coli or salmonella. Also, they carry water. On um, the other day when we were discussing uh, the outbreak of salmonella at Chipotle Grill with the spinach, what they learned is that one of the main farms where they purchased their produce from, there was a hog farm miles above the, the produce farm. And when the hogs were washed or when it rained, the water would wash down to the produce farm, contaminating the spinach with E. coli from the uh, hogs. And uh, they learned that over a year's period of time, it took them that long to figure out where this outbreak was. So when you determine in a restaurant that you have an outbreak, the outbreak is according to the- uh, health standards is based on two or more people that have the symptoms, uh, same symptoms. So that doesn't mean that you necessarily run out and call your health department. When I was a, a chef or a manager or a director, um, when I'm, someone told me they had uh, felt sick from eating the food or they called in and said, uh, I think I ate something last <laughs> night, I feel ill. Well, what I would do is research. I would go uh, take their name, their information, get their contact uh, information, find out you know what their symptoms were and what they ate on the menu. Then I would go back uh, and talk to the uh, cook or the chefs and find out you know what was going on that evening, who was cooking, what was served, check the food product. Many times, especially now with what you're seeing, what's going on in our society with COVID, people may have the flu or they may have uh, a lot of medicine. Uh, please mute your mics, please. Everyone mute your mics. Uh, it could be that it was an outbreak uh, or uh, many times for incidences, people drank too much. I found many times that they went to other establishments, they drank heavy, then came into the restaurant to dine and uh, went home and got sick and they were saying it was food poisoning, but actually in reality it was that they uh, consumed too much alcohol. Um, there are instances where you may have a couple of people that have gotten sick, but what you prominently, if you really have a, a food born and it's more than two people, your phone's going to start ringing off the hook. You're going to have people calling in. And in the case with Chipotle Grill, it wasn't just one establishment. They used the same vendor for their produce and their spinach, and they had many people calling from all over various regions and used that aid at other Chipotle grills saying that they were sick. 
once you realize that, hey, this possibly is a outbreak of food poisoning, then you it's your responsibility as a chef or manager to speak with your local health department. And you're not going to call up and say, hey, I have an outbreak of food poisoning. You're simply going to call in and report and say, uh, state the facts. Here's what's happening. Here's the people that I've contacted. They've all had the same symptoms. Um, here's the food source. Uh, I believe it's from uh, my source vendor. And then you would discuss that with the state and local. Your local health department is who you would talk to first. And in our county, it would be Palm Beach County Health Department. Uh, and then they would take the further steps to notify the state, the regulatory authorities, and then they would uh, investigate. Um, one thing we said with the outbreak of food poisoning is that you really want to make sure that your restaurant is following regulations, following standards, um, making sure that you have the HACCP standards, which we talked about, hazardous analysis, critical control points in place. And the reason for this is that um, if you have these standards in place, you're monitoring temperatures and the production of where the food came from. And uh, this allows you to go back and track steps if someone tells you, I'm sick, I'm ill, or, and they ate this particular dish or this food. So what's happening now with this case of these Italian meats where people are sick is that um, they're now gonna go back and research the distributor and the vendors. All right, so these are the challenges. It takes time and it takes money. You have to implement these procedures. Many of your major hotel companies and your restaurant chains already have people in place uh, that all they do is inspect their own regular, uh, uh, regular facilities. So Hilton and Marriott have their own corporate sanitation inspectors. And for you as um, graduates, when you get ready to graduate from the program, this is a job that you could, uh, could get. I noticed when I was looking at the job descriptions this uh, summer for students to apply to, there were many um, jobs available for health inspectors and uh, they were corporate jobs. They weren't through the colony. So um, Marriott, Hilton, um, Davidson uh, Hospitality Group, were all looking for inspectors, okay? Um, and now everything is in uh, many different languages. So if you go to your chemical company, uh, they will have many languages if to post in your kitchen for your uh, employees. Um, so if you need it in Spanish, you can get that. If you need it in many different dialects in Asian um, culture, out West, you have a lot of different Asian populations. You can get the dialects to put into your um, kitchens. There are done pictures, there's diagrams in the charts so your staff can understand uh, the presentation of how the chemicals are used. You implement training programs. So before your cooks start in the kitchen, and they um, work on a station, go through part of the training should not just be how to cook or prepare dishes, but it should be where dishes go when they're dirty, where the three compartment sink is, how you want food stored, how you want your chemical stored. All of that should be part of the training. And training shouldn't just be uh, videos. They shouldn't just be, you know, um, most companies, that I'm familiar with, they sit uh, someone in front of a video, they put a video on and then they have to take a quiz afterwards. There should be many different types of the training and learning process and uh, being in a facility and touching and feeling and going around and demonstrating is one of the best ways uh, for hospitality people to learn. So pathogen is uh, bacteria that are uh, hazardous, they're poisonous to us, because we all know that there are certain types of bacteria that we have to have as, as humans as part of our nature. Again, we talked about the suppliers, making sure that you're using approved suppliers um, and then um, uh, make, uh, removing high risk for your customers. And um, if you have staff turnover, you're gonna have to constantly keep training your staff on sanitary uh, practices. So that's why you wanna make sure 
that you don't have high staff turnover, that you do keep your staff. Now, if you have an outbreak of foodborne illness um, in, to, in today's world with social media, Facebook, uh, you know, uh, all LinkedIn, uh, all these different social media sites, you're going to see, uh, hey, don't go down to so-and-so restaurant. You know, um, they had an outbreak. It's going to make the news. It'll make the media. And this is loss in revenue to your business. Also loss of reputation. Some of you may aspire to be a top uh, famous celebrity chef. Well, if you own a restaurant and you have an outbreak in Salmonella, you're not going to get that reputation because you're going to be known for the chef that owned the restaurant that got so many uh, people sick. And then, as we said, negative media expo exposure and then loss of morale for your staff. Who wants to work in a place that has a reputation of being filthy or dirty? Um, my daughter uh, worked uh, as a delivery person for FedEx and she used to have to deliver to some restaurants that she would come home to us and say, hey, make sure you don't go down to such and such restaurant. Their kitchen is filthy. She went down to one local chain restaurant that was famous and found out that they were proofing their rolls in a warm area in the back of the kitchen near the bathrooms. Uh, how unsanitary is that? And once she saw that, she came home and said, hey, don't eat there. And this was a very popular restaurant on Fridays and Saturday nights, the restaurant was packed. So imagine if something happened on that bread that they were proofing and people got sick. Okay, it costs uh, your operations. So if people get sick, they're gonna sue. Now you do have insurance that will cover you, but your insurance premiums could go up or you could have a major corporate chain outbreak like Chipotle Grill and uh, you only have so much in your insurance policy that'll cover you and then you start have to paying out of pocket. Your staff will miss, miss work because they're sick or they don't want to work in an environment where uh, you have um, low morale, insurance premiums will go up and then you'll have high turnover in staff because they don't want to work in that type of environment. So um, safe food, uh, biological, that's pathogenic uh, chemicals and uh, I mean, biological pathogens, you want to make sure that we keep them safe. Uh, cooking kills some of that. Vinegars, acids, wines will kill some. Freezing certain type of foods, uh, some of the pathogenic bacteria are killed. Make sure you store your chemicals away from your production area. Store them in a separate storeroom area away from your dry goods. And then your physical contaminants are rubber bands, metal shavings, uh, rocks, dirt, and things that get into food. Um, okay, so biological, we're going to uh, follow up on this again, bacteria. Bacteria are um, types of uh, things that we could kill in the cooking process. Uh, e. coli, salmonella are types of bacteria that can be killed in the cooking process. But it also, it depends on the amount of growth, you know, whether they're in lag phase or how much bacteria is in the product. Some, some products, if you had a seafood bisque or a, a seafood chowder, they could be so full of bacteria that there's no way the cooking process will kill that. You have to throw that out. And viruses, all of us have become really uh, exposed to knowing more about viruses because of coronavirus. The most too common in the hospitality industry is the Norwalk virus and hepatitis A. On cruise lines recently, you've seen a lot of people um, get outbreaks of the Norwalk virus. And uh, this is from poor sanitation, poor hygiene. This is transferred from people to people, just like hepatitis A is usually transferred from a uh, kitchen staff person uh, to a guest. Okay, parasites, I gave you an example the other day in Hawaii, they had small snails. The small st snails are, uh, were on romaine lettuce and um, people were not washing the lettuce correctly. Uh, people digested the parasites and some people actually got very sick and ill and had to be hospitalized. One lady who already had liver uh, problems actually died from that. And we talked about fungi. We said black mold and um, these type of ingredients um, grow sometimes in walk-in coolers, dark 
damp areas. A lot of kitchens are in back areas, back loading docks where this if not cleaned or sanitized properly, they would grow in those areas. Chemical contaminants are the chemicals that we buy to clean the kitchen. So some of them are potentially hazardous. We use uh, sprays for stainless steel. We use sprays on uh, chemicals on the floor. We use sanitizers to sanitize our pots and pans and dishware. And some of the polishes that we use on copper or pots and pans, if these get into our food, they become contaminated. And then we said physical hazards were physical shavings or metal shavings, staples. We say, well, how that would that get into food? Or our lettuce or produce boxes have staples that they use to shut the boxes. Bandages from uh, cooks or kitchen personnel. Bandages get on people's hands and they, they, they fall off and get into uh, various uh, items that we're cooking. Glass, people drop dishes or break glass around the prep area or the hot station. It gets into the food. And the rule of thumb is no glass around the prep area. You want to have plastic or paper containers when you're drinking beverages. If you do have glass and it breaks and it drops and it gets into the food, the rule is you throw everything out on the cook's line and you start over. You don't want to take that uh, chance of uh, someone eating glass. Dirt, dirt can be from lettuces and, and salads that the product is not washed thoroughly. Sand is a big common area. People will eat through le uh, lettuces and salads that we're serving and they say they're very sandy. Um, natural ob objects. So when people eat fish and chicken, it's natural that they're going, they may get a bone or a piece of bone. But uh, we as chefs and culinarians, we try to make sure that there's no bone, all the bone is boneless. There's no uh, tiny little fish bones and things like that in the fish or the chicken that we are eating. The five risk factors of foodborne illness, purchasing food from the unsafe source, failing to cook the food correctly, and that's where the HACCP plan uh, falls into place to monitor the production and temperature of food, um, holding food at correct temperatures, 140 degrees is what we should hold food on a steam table, 40 degrees cold in the cold pantry or in our refrigeration, using contaminated equipment. A good example is a slicer. You go into um, the market, they usually have one slicer for cheeses and one slicer for meats. Um, if you take cheese and meat and you slice it going back and forth, you contaminate a product and it's a cold product, it's not heated up, so we don't kill any of the bacteria that we could kill if it was possibly contaminated. So if the slicers are not washed and I sit overnight and over a period of time, bacteria growth will grow on them. Practicing proper hygiene. The reason why we want you to use uniforms in a kitchen is that so that you're not using your street clothes. Most of your large hotels and resorts have locker rooms. They keep your uniforms in your locker. So you take off your street clothes and you put on your kitchen uniform that you use in the kitchen. It also allows the chef to see if the clothes are clean. That's why we use white, just like in healthcare. White will show that everything is clean on your uniform and that you've been washing them thoroughly. If you don't, if you would continue to wear a dirty jacket, it's going to grow bacteria just like um, it would on a equipment or other things. Um, hair has to be restrained in our kitchen labs. If you have a ponytail or long hair, and that's, it must be restrained and put up or it, you must have a hair net on. So there are different types of thermometers. The most common one that we use in the, the hot kitchens is what's called a probe. So the first picture you see up on the top left, time temperature abuse, that is a probe, it's computerized. It's you put the probe into the product and it measures the temperature. Cross contamination as you see in the top right picture is a person was cutting a uh, chicken on a cutting board and now they're going to cut, looks like lettuce or cabbage on the same cutting board without thoroughly sanitizing the board. They did a, 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 a test throughout grocery stores on chicken and they learned that most grocery stores, the chicken still has 64% salmonella. So that means that you need to cook that chicken thoroughly and you need to keep your kitchen sanitized. Down in the bottom left is poor personal hygiene. 
that person looks like they have an open wound and they're scratching themselves before they go to work in the production area. Poor cleaning and sanitizing. We wanna make sure we're using the uh, allotted special sanitizing for our surfaces. So when we get into the lab, we will um, use the sprays and chemicals to wipe down and I will demonstrate to you how and what chemicals we will be using. So a HACCP plan, hazardous analysis, critical control point. The first step is why food becomes unsafe. And the most common abuse is the time temperature uh, abuse. So foods are not cooked and held properly. Foods are not, cold foods are not stored properly. Our refrigeration units aren't working properly and they're not holding food. The time temperature danger zone is 40 degrees and 135 or 140 degrees. Uh, your test on your exam says like 135, but I, I always teach 140. So that means when we probe the food in the hotline, it has to be 140 degrees hot. When we reheat food, we reheat it to 145 degree temperature. That means if it's sitting in a cooler and we take it out and it's a soup or a sauce and we have to reheat it, we have to bring it up to temperature before we put it into the steam table or the holding line. Foods become unsafe because they have not been properly stored. The temperatures haven't been uh, properly monitored. And in the HACCP plan, we said, many of you will be writing HACCP plans and it starts with the menu. You write the menu, then you source your food. So where your food is being sourced from and what dish the food's gonna be used for is going to determine the HACCP plan. I get it in from my sourced vendor. It goes into production. I follow that food product throughout the production stage taking temperatures and recording those temperatures, making sure that we're keeping them out of the temperature danger zone and following the halves of plan. So if the food is not properly brought up to temperature or cooked properly, it doesn't kill pathogens. And if the food is not cooled correctly, so we're making soups, we're making sauces, or we have leftover foods that we want to cool down from the steam table that we know that we can reuse for service the next day, we have to bring them down to 40 degrees, cooling them down in ice baths, cooling them down in small uh, portions or smaller containers to bring them down to 40 degrees temperature before we put them in the cooler. And once we put them in the cooler, we cover them, we label, and we date them. Everything that we use in the lab and out in the industry should all be labeled and dated so we know how long that product has been stored in the refrigeration unit. Cross-contamination, when pathogens are transferred from one surface to another. It could be on a cutting board. It could be a slicer or a piece of equipment. It could be spoons, ladles, or service utensils that are used uh, when we go from a raw or cooked product, putting it into a hot cooked uh, line product, or we have it on a cutting board stirring raw chicken and we might stir a salad or something. Those are cross-contaminations. We have to Get discard the utensil, use a new utensil or wash the utensil thoroughly, sanitize it, and then use it for uh, another purpose. Cross-contamination um, can cause uh, uh, and contaminated foods and ingredients that are, have no cooking. So we can take something and put it into a food product. We can take a raw vegetable, like a leaf vegetable, like spinach, and it's not cooked. And let's say we want to put it into a salad or we put it into a minestrone. It's not cooked. That's a method of cross-contamination. Ready to eat food. Sometimes we don't reheat foods and follow the packaging direction on the uh, ready to eat foods, such as um, reheated lasagnas or reheated casseroles and, and such. Casseroles and bisques and chowders are probably the most common uh, outbreak of food foreign diseases usually in a food service type operation, like in a healthcare, college and university, or a um, business and industry account. Okay, food handler is uh, touches a contaminated surface. Um, all of us are learning about COVID virus. It said that COVID virus will last on the surface for a certain number of seconds, 20 seconds. That's why they're saying to make sure you 
thoroughly washed down like surface. Hep C and Norwalk virus are the same. That's why when you see an outbreak of Norwalk virus on a cruise ship, you're going to see people with spray bottles wiping everything down, uh, cleaning everything to make sure they kill the virus. Uh, using uh, contaminated cloths. Many people in the industry, uh, chefs and prep cooks in the kitchen will have a side towel, they call it. It's a towel they put on their aprons and they use as they walk through the kitchen and during production. But then they'll constantly use that towel to wipe services or pull hot pans out of the oven. And as they're going through, they keep the same towel day to day and they're cross-contaminating as they're wiping surfaces. So um, I don't like to use side towels in the kitchen. We'll use a spray bottle and rags and we wash the rags or we'll, I like to have paper towels in the kitchen because the paper towels are disposable. Uh, it does get costly to have paper disposable towels in the kitchen, but it, it uh, alleviates uh, cross-contamination. So poor, poor personal hygiene, failure to wash hands correctly. All through this uh, pandemic, you've been seeing videos and people talking about how to wash properly and how to sanitize properly. If we follow the regular methods that you're taught to work in a kitchen, washing and wiping things down, you will not have cross-contamination, okay? Coughing and sneezing on food is how hepatitis A and the Norwalk virus is transferred. Um, same with if you have coronavirus, if you're coughing and sneezing, please don't come into the lab, don't come into school. Um, also, um, uh, you contaminate from one person to the, up, to the other. Open wounds and working while you're sick. Okay, poor cleaning and sanitizing. Equipment and utensils are not washed. When we go into the lab, I'm going to show you how to set up the three compartment sink. Um, we always spray everything down. We scrape everything first. Then it goes into the wash tank, then into the rinse tank. And then we use a iodine solution, which is given to us by our vendor. And it's all uh, measured with uh, actually, you just push a button the titration level of the chemical and water mix is already set. And then you sanitize and air dry. We air dry everything. We don't put them uh, into uh, the storeroom wet. And I don't like to use uh, uh, too many towels on things. We allow them air dry because that's the best way for uh, product not to become cross-contaminated. Okay. Um, temperature controlled foods, TCS, these are the foods that are uh, most likely for cross contamination. Poultry, as we know, salmonella in the chicken has to be cooked to 165 degrees. Well done. Internal temperature to kill bacteria. Salmon, uh, a lot of salmon will have um, various uh, types of uh, shingleitis and different types of diseases. Shellfish is very common. Now, when you go to take your certified sanitation exam, you have to know that shellfish, we have to keep the tags for 90 days. Um, that means, many of you don't know this, but there is no USDA inspection for fresh fish. In Hawaii or in California or here in Florida, you can have a local fisherman deliver fresh fish. You can have ahi tuna, anything for salmon or that fresh fish delivered to your restaurant to use. That's not the same with shellfish. Shellfish has to be a resource vendor or uh, you have to have the tags. And if uh, you're getting um, clams or oyster from a local fisherman or woman, they have to have a certified inspection to be able to give those tags. What the tags tell you is where the shellfish or the oysters came from, what waters they're out of, and um, you have to hold them in a file cabinet or a drawer for 90 days. And that is a question on the surf safe exam. Then up top here, you have an eye round of uh, beef. You wanna make sure that it's cooked correctly to the internal temperature. Most meat, uh, the HACCP plan will tell you 140 degrees, but most chefs will say 140 degrees is cooking the meat too well. So that's a fine line of how to cook the beef. Uh, for eggs, 
Eggs become contaminated on the shells on the outside because when the hen lays the eggs, that's where the uh, E. coli or the salmonella will be. If you crack the egg or the shell and then you get um, contaminant in it, then it becomes contaminated. <laughs> Okay, more foods that are likely. Um, there was an outbreak of botulism in a chain restaurant. And they could not find out or figure out where this outbreak of botulism was coming from. After months of study, they learned that the restaurant baked potatoes, kept the potatoes overnight in wrapped foil, and used them in the morning for hash browns or home fries. Well, what they learned is that the cooks were not rotating the potatoes correctly. So an older batch of potatoes that should have been used first sat on top of the stove wrapped in foil. Over a period of time, the foil wrapped potato grew botulism. And botulism is a type of bacteria that grows in an anaerobic environment, dark, no oxygen, no moisture, sealed. And usually that's why they tell you when you find a can that's dented or pierced or uh, looks uh, malformed, uh, throw it out, don't use it. That's why they, they didn't think to look at the potatoes. It took them many months to figure out that the potatoes were the cause for the botulism. Okay, rice, rice is a grain. So when you're cooking rice, you're gonna see in some rices, there's uh, weevils or small bugs. Uh, the rice has to be cooked correctly and then stored correctly, okay? Um, bean sprouts or alfalfa sprouts are served raw. They're learning in the hospitality industry that these are actually one of the most common causes for outbreak of uh, salmonella. Uh, they're raw, they come right off of the, the sprout of a bush on a bean. Uh, so they're learning that. So improperly held foods cross contaminates. Uh, some people are making their own oils and vinegars and they're taking a leafy herb and putting it in and sealing the jar with the oil. A lot of chefs make their own oils, but they're learning over a certain period of time that the uh, either botulism grows or that there is bacteria on the herb that grows and causes an anaerobic pathogenic bacteria to grow, causing for people to get sick. So one of the more common areas is ready to eat food. So many of you are you know, going to work in establishments that purchase food that's going to simply have to be reheated in the oven. What they're learning is that people are not following the instructions on the package and it goes into the oven. And when they go to measure the internal temperature, they're not taking the correct internal temperature and the product is uh, not reheated correctly. They serve it and then guests are getting sick. We discussed the other day that high risk Elderly people, we all know when we had the first start of the outbreak of the pandemic or coronavirus, a lot of the nursing homes were the main source of the, the pandemic and a lot of elderly people were dying from the virus. And that's because they have weak immune system. Young children or preschool age children are susceptible because their immune systems are not fully developed. And then people with compromised immune systems, meaning that people that have, um, cancer, leukemia, are going through some type of a treatment for another disease, their immune system is down. And if they were to catch an outbreak of a pathogenic foodborne illness, it could kill them or make them very, very ill. So to follow up and summarize, keeping food safe, you wanna control time temperature, learn the HACCP plan. There are seven steps and um, start memorizing the steps. Prevent cross-contamination, practice personal hygiene, purchase from approved reputable suppliers. Constantly clean and sanitize your kitchen and work, work in space and environment, okay? Training is very important. Many of the people that you're gonna hire are not going to be professionally trained workers, especially now with what's going on in the hospitality industry where we have a shortage of staff and personnel. 
They're hiring people that are right out of high school that are, um, have never worked in the hospitality industry. They don't understand food safety. So make sure they go through a training program. Uh, in the state of Florida, all people have to have the food handler's card. That means you have to take a quick training program and a quick exam, uh, just like a driver's test and have the food handler's card. Your certification allows you to manage 10 people so for every 10 people in an operation, one person has to have the food manager's certification. Uh, then keep uh, follow-up training. Send out your staff for continuous training, workshops, seminars, webinars to keep them up on what's happening. Uh, if you train your staff and they are happy and um, like where they're working, you're not gonna have a high turnover. Monitor your temperatures, monitor your HASA plan, who's gonna be the record keeper, who's gonna be the one that follows up for the corrective actions. If something is in the temperature danger zone or if there's cross contamination, who's gonna be the person to say, you need to throw that out, record and document the step for HACCP records. Who is going to be assigned that task? and constantly document. Okay, this is on the exam. Also, you need to understand who regulates um, the Food and Drug Administration, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture are the ones that regulate inspections of hog, pork, chicken, poultry, eggs. One is uh, providing 